So this video is looking to the year ahead. Uh, there's not much point in looking ahead to the Christmas week. There could be some market activity, but it's nothing is scheduled. So it's a good opportunity. And we normally try to look ahead to the, the forthcoming year. And I'll do it by asset class, the, the major asset classes by, uh, that are traded by LCG traders. So namely equities, forex, commodities, and I'll we'll touch on cryptocurrencies. Now, when we're talking about equities, of course, we have to start with the major global benchmark, which is the S&P 500. Now, that index, the S&P 500, is up, at the time of speaking, 28% this year, which is absolutely huge in terms of annual returns. Now, there's a, a couple of things you have to consider with this. Okay, that has obviously been a strong up year, but in the preceding 20 months through to October, the market really was actually quite range bound. In fact, it was pretty much went nowhere for 20 months. And it was only in October that we broke out two new record highs, uh, broke out to new record highs and broke out of the trading range. So even though the, the S&P 500 has just had a massive year uh, to the upside, it doesn't preclude having another upside year uh, in 2020 um, of, uh, but because we've moved arguably out of a trading range and into a trending environment. And in fact, trending environment has further to go, uh, then we've still got a few months of, of bullish trending before us. Now, I want to tr cover some of these other indices as well. Uh, worth mentioning the FTSE 100 is a slightly different ball game there, plus 12% on the year. It has not broken its range yet, and we know all the reasons why. Of course, we had the deadlock over Brexit and the resulting political and economic uncertainty, which is meant to trumble on into 2020, but slightly to a lesser degree. And we're pretty positive here. I mean, we think that actually with the Brexit deal signed off, of course, trade negotiations need to continue, uh, need to begin with the EU and with some other countries, including the US. But nonetheless, the, the, the direction is better known now, and that should encourage some investment into UK assets. In the DAX, a yeah, very similar story to the S&P 500. Uh, that's plus 25% on the year. Uh, German stocks still not broken back up to record highs, so they're still uh, inside the range. Uh, they've been in for a while. And so, again, arguably more value to be had in the UK and Europe than the US, obviously, that it is pushing into record highs, albeit earnings are lower in Europe. Uh, in Japan, almost middle of the road is plus 17%. Again, a great return right on the cusp of a two-year price range breakout. Of course, record highs in the Nikkei are still quite distant uh, because that was the level we'd have to get back up to the, you know, the booming times of Japan, which are still a, a decade in the past at this point. Um, but nonetheless, potentially a big top in the Nikkei if we stumble or, again, a big breakout resembling that of what we've seen in the S&P 500 in October. So rounding all this off together, we've had a strong year in equities, but potentially there's more upside because we're actually breaking out of some prolonged sideways ranges here. So we, we rallied from the bottom of the range to the top and above in some cases, uh, but there could be still more to go. Now, as far as the general economics out there, we are still in this low interest rate environment. Um, we, in fact, we've got negative rates across the globe and we have this positive growth outlook. Um, the, the general thought process out there is that because of the de-escalation in the trade war, growth should pick up sometime in the first or second quarter. So you've got a, a positive combination, obviously, of low interest rates and good growth. Uh, that should be a good thing for equity markets, less good for bonds uh, and good for some commodities in patches. If the better global growth and low interest rates lead to higher commodity demand. The only risk factor there potentially is actually some of the big central banks out there are reconsidering the negative interest rate policy. And if they start to raise interest rates, uh, then obviously that sort of undoes some of the positive benefit for being in, in equities and, and encourages you a bit more, a bit more in defensive assets like bonds. Of course, in terms of the general economic environment, it's worth mentioning we did get an inverted yield curve in the summer. So as a reminder, that's typically a signal of a recession. It's not such a good indicator in other parts of the world, but in the US, it's been a pretty reliable indicator. Uh, and so generally, if history is to be believed, somewhere in the next 18 months, there will be a recession in the US 
um, after that inversion of the yield curve. And that happened in the summer. So logic being, by the end of next year, we're potentially looking at a, uh, a recession. And that would be quite interesting timing because that is actually when we have the US presidential election. But again, we've had cut interest rates uh, and we've had a lot of stimulus in the US and it looks like the trade war is going to be scaled back. So probably Donald Trump aware that the economy needs to be good in time for the election. So he's put a few things in place there which help his chances of that being the case. The only risk factor really being this, uh, the timing of when this inverted yield curve could, uh, could kick in in terms of its forecasting ability for an actual recession in the US. Of course, that uh, US election is probably the single biggest event of the year. And at this point, we don't really know who the runners and riders, we know the runners and riders, but we don't know obviously who the democratic candidate is. So there's not so much we can say at this point, only so far as to say if it does end up being a very anti-capitalist candidate, like for example, Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, uh, were they to actually win the election, and take over from Trump, who's a bit of a capitalist populist, uh, you would imagine that should be negative for markets uh, by implication of the kind of policies that they want to bring in. Uh, it would dissuade capital from coming into the US under that kind of environment, we suspect. Right, enough of all that, let's move on to the Forex market. And again, some of these macro f factors uh, will actually play into the Forex market too. Uh, so in 2019, euro dollar has been in a pretty steady downtrend. So it's actually finishing the year at minus 2.8%. It's been a very consistent downtrend, but it's been very meandering. There hasn't been uh, a whole lot of volatility in the forex market this year, um, uh, mostly because of the surprise turn to dovishness by the, uh, the Federal Reserve and some of the other big central banks out there. What we think could be the, the turning point is that European growth um, is going to theoretically pick up from the easier financial conditions and the cease in the trade war. Uh, we've already started to see this a bit through the German PMIs seemingly bottoming out. Um, if there is some kind of fiscal stimulus in Europe, now this has not got through the hurdle of Germany yet, but there is seemingly a bit of a kind of shake up in the power structure in Angela Merkel's party. Uh, her partner party have elected a different leader who's got a slightly more socialist bent. Uh, the chance of some sort of fiscal spending taking over from the ECB, where obviously we have the new president, um, Christine Lagarde, uh, who has her history at the IMF, and so is more of a politician, arguably, than an economist. Uh, the chances seem actually increased that there would be more fiscal stimulus and less monetary stimulus in Europe. What does that mean? It means less printing euros and devaluing euros, and it means some things that are good for the economy, the government spending. So that actually all points to potentially an ending to this meandering downtrend that we just discussed in euro dollar, potentially a bottom in euro dollar. Um, and uh, maybe we're looking at a weaker dollar year, a stronger euro year. But let's see if those factors, factors pan out. Of course, things can and will likely change. Uh, let's talk about sterling. Well, uh, been obviously the most interesting currency this year, dropped a lot and then rose a lot. So net net, we're up 3.3% at the time of talking. Um, we think there's more to go on the upside of this and that would support the euro story and the euro story supports this. You know, generally the other major currencies move in sync against the dollar. Um, why would that be? Well, we've really put to bed the idea of a really extreme form of socialism taking over the politics in the UK for the time being because of the size of the majority. The Conservatives won in the election. So Jeremy Corbyn's out. Uh, his kind of radical socialism has been put to the side. From an investing standpoint, obviously politics aside, from an investing standpoint, that's good news. And we think a bit of money comes in to the UK off the back of that, even though, of course, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how exactly this trade deal pans out with Europe. Uh, and there's obviously a chance that we just finish 2020 without a trade deal, but uh, we think there probably will be. It will just be a bit of a watered down trade deal. You can't be as ambitious as you maybe you could be if you took longer to actually strike the deal. Last but not least, in terms of the major currency pairs, dollar yen, uh, it's minus 1.6% on the year. So um, you can see how the dollar's had a bit of a mixed bag. It's been up against some currencies, down against others. You know, it's um, obviously been down slightly against the yen. The Bank of Japan seem to be on hold and seem to be keeping their stimulus as it has been for a while now, but uh, they're trying to wind it down, I think. And the general thought process, out, 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 thought process out there is that the Bank of Japan 
will uh, stop their monetary stimulus and try to uh, wind down their asset purchases in maybe 2022. Um, and in the time being, they are introducing fiscal stimulus to try and pick up the economy. Similar idea with the euro, that should be good for the yen. If you, if you remember that in the US they've already had the fiscal stimulus, now these other countries are kind of catching up. And so that should be good for their respective currencies. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the commodities now. So gold being an interesting one. We've been long-term bullish for gold on gold for a while now. Why might gold be something interesting in 2020? Well, this kind of relates to equities, but if we do start to get some jitters, maybe sometime early in the year, that actually we do have the genuine risk of an anti-capitalist presidential candidate and an eventual president even in the US, uh, investors are obviously going to look for havens, gold being the natural haven. So that could create some demand for gold. Um, equally, if something does turn sour with the economy, central banks have to turn the taps on again and, and maybe lower interest rates, um, increase the amount of QE they're doing, that's all upside possibilities for gold. The, the biggest risk for gold is that we'd see a generally more benign environment, equity markets trending higher uh, without any overt money printing from central banks. That, that's the kind of environment where the gold can't do so well, but if these other currencies do well, as we suggested, and the dollar weakens, uh, a weaker dollar is a very good reason to, to hold on some gold in your portfolio, uh, or at least do a bit of trading in it. Um, oil, oil's interesting in that uh, the, the market's plus 22% this year in Brent um, and plus 35% in WTI, so actually massive, massive years for, for oil. But um, it's been choppy. We, you know, we came from a, some sharp down moves and we've had some, a resurgence from there. We finished the year around three month highs, uh, but that gave us good gains for the, uh, for the year. So risk factors here, I mean, oil's been kind of range bound for a while. So when, when, the, when it's been range bound, you, again, you're looking for that kind of breakout into a trend. Um, the most interesting is quite possibly on the upside because a lot of the uh, U.S. shale, which has been flooding the market, adding to the supply and keeping oil prices low, um, is being funded with high yield debt in the U.S. Now, if there is some uh, event in the U.S. which prevents this debt being rolled over, perhaps the banks don't believe that uh, these oil companies in the U.S. are good to repay back uh, the, the loans they've taken out at high interest rates because oil prices just aren't high enough and they're not making enough money. Uh, then that jeopardizes production from the US. We've hit record high output in the US, but maybe it peaks in 2020, never gets any better. If that's the case, because of the, the unprofitability of the companies pumping the oil, then actually suddenly that oil that was expected to be out there from the US isn't anymore, uh, and that could be an upward pressure on prices. So that's a potential upside shock. To the downside, it's maybe that Saudi Arabia uh, and the rest um, keep producing, uh, you know, decent amounts of oil close to record levels. So does the U.S. and supply overwhelms maybe a more muted demand outlook out there in terms of uh, global demand. Right. Last but not least, of course, I wanted to mention these cryptocurrencies. Um, it's been a pretty stellar year by by most accounts. Bitcoin is going to finish the year at the time again at the time of filming about around plus eighty percent. Um, but it's actually disappointing if you started um, holding Bitcoin at the start of the year and now you're plus 80%. You wouldn't expect to be disappointed, but actually we're down 50% from the peak. So you could have been, uh, you know, significantly higher, 160% in the, in, the, in the black had you taken your money out at the top. Obviously very difficult to do in a volatile market. One thing that would be interesting to look out for this year is that we've got the so-called halving. So this is where production of Bitcoin, the mining of Bitcoin, is going to halve. And this happens every four years or so. So the expectation, going again, going back to that kind of general supply and demand idea, is that when the cut, uh, production of Bitcoin is cut by 50%, there'd be less Bitcoins out there. And so those Bitcoins that are left should be worth more. And uh, there might be some kind of reaction in markets and cause a big push up in prices. Worth knowing that after the first halving, Bitcoin rose 80 times in value, but obviously that was during a massive bull market. The second time it rose four, four times after a bit of a decline. 
So we've had a bit of a decline here. In fact, the price has halved. So potentially we're up for a repeat of one of these two price gains we've seen in the past. You've got to say that Bitcoin tends to move up a lot and down, up and down. Uh, it's dropped, it's fallen by value by 50%. That's a level that obviously catches people's interest when the value of something's halved. Um, so potentially an opportunity. Uh, on the flip side, potentially it's the beginning of the end. We weren't able to get back up towards 20,000 in Bitcoin. Uh, we only felt, you know, we peaked out around 12,000 and dropped from there. Uh, maybe if we get below 6,000, which was a big supply level in the past, that could be the capitulation level for many people where we just end up seeing the, the, the bottom fall out and the end of the bubble. Right, so I hope that was interesting. Quite a few charts uh, on display in this video. Um, and obviously the video is, I think, slightly longer than normal, so I hope that's okay. But um, should be an interesting year. Lots going on, obviously, the presidential election and um, some markets hopefully ready to break out and have some volatility and, and be worthwhile trading. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Uh, happy Christmas, uh, happy new year. And uh, if you do like these videos, of course, make sure to register and follow me and LCG on YouTube and social media.